at the Maryland and Translation uh, Core Center. Um, he's going to talk to us today about um, a new study that he's doing with uh, our co collaborators at the University of Colorado. And the title of his talk is Design of a Phase II First in ADPKD Clinical Trial of the Sodium Glucose Transporter 2 Inhibitor, SGLT2I, and Bugaflozin. So with that, Steve, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Terry. I just wanted to check first to make sure that my screen is in the right mode. Can everyone see it in presentation mode? Okay. We got through the first challenge of Zoom. Thanks so much, and thanks for the opportunity to talk to everyone. And uh, of course, some of my uh, colleagues in this trial are here on the call too. So um, perhaps uh, if there are questions that I can't answer, we can um, we can also ask them for help as well. So this is a, a first in ADPKD clinical trial, what we would describe as a phase two uh, trial of empagliflozin, a, a sodium glucose cotransporter two inhibitor, SGLT2 inhibitor. Before I, I get to the design of the study, I wanted to spend just a few minutes sort of um, providing a high level and um, uh, brief overview of where we stand with the development of pharmacologic interventions in this space, and then talk uh, about the physiology um, and pharmacology of the sodium glucose cotransporter 2 and its inhibition, uh, what we know about the effects of inhibition uh, in um, patients who have other types of chronic kidney disease, and what we know of the potential effects on human patients with ADPKD from largely from almost entirely from preclinical models. And then um, getting into how this all motivated our, our study and what are some of the key sort of design challenges that we faced that we, uh, and the way that we address them. So uh, I appreciate this is a bit, very busy uh, table, intentionally so, but it, it provides at a sort of sh uh, snapshot in time, a whole range of drugs that have been tested in various phases of development, uh, and in particular, uh, the specific molecular targets of these drugs. So of course, the ones that are only uh, so far only FDA approved, which are the vasopressin 2 receptor antagonist, Tolvaptin, and the trials that led to its development, but other targets that have been considered, including tyrosine kinases, somatostatin uh, receptors, mTOR, uh, and inhibitors of that uh, pathway, of course, the HALT ADPKD trial, uh, AMPK, uh, HMG QA reductase. So um, this is where we stand. We have one FDA approved drug. Um, I'm going to talk about that in a second. There have been um, that trial, excuse me, Tolvaptin was studied in a phase three and a phase three B trial, follow-up trials. And on average, for example, in this study, uh, it decreased 12 month decline in EGFR by about 1.3 mLs per meter per minute per 1.3 meter second, um, a meter squared. And that you know may seem uh, some, uh, somewhat modest effect, although others have argued if you annualize this out over many years or decades of an individual patient that translates into a, a clinically meaningful delay in the development of end-stage kidney disease. The effect was somewhat larger in, in younger patients, though the number of older patients was not, not very large in, in this phase 3B trial. Um, there were uh, common side effects, of course, that many of which of us are familiar with, and particularly those who treat patients with this drug, aquaresis, so nocturia, thirst, polyuria, and the small risk of acute liver injury, which requires uh, a risk evaluation management system or REMS um, uh, uh, if patients are going to be um, prescribed this medication, so frequent monitoring of liver functions. It is currently approved for the slowing of PKD progression at those at high risk of progression. And some of us are aware of, because we've been part of these trials, which have recently been terminated for a variety of reasons, and these looked at different molecular targets, an alternative inhibitor of the V2 receptor, Lixavaptin, which was hypothesized to cause less liver injury. It was terminated in phase two of development because, of, as I understand it, one single case of liver injury. Um, the Nrf2, Bardoxolone, a drug that's been studied in many other disease models, um, but the phase three trial was also terminated because of its lack of efficacy in diabetic nephropathy. And Venglistat, which uh, targets the glycosphingolipid pathway, was stopped essentially, if, and I apologize to any of those if I'm mischaracterizing it, but in my understanding for, for clinical futility or lack of clinical efficacy because it did not impact the change in total kidney volume. So clearly we're, we're at a stage now where, although it's very exciting as a clinical investigator in this field to see a lot of active drug development, it's also obviously the case that we still need to expand our drug development and that many of these drugs are uh, have 
either potential off target toxicities uh, or our lack of efficacy at tolerable doses. Uh, and therefore we need to really expand uh, the types of drugs that we're looking at and the types of targets. And so that leads to the sodium glucose co-transporter and its inhibition. And I'm gonna just start with a, a very brief review of the uh, molecular physiology, this transporter, the two isoform is found in the um, apical membrane of the uh, proximal tubular epithelial cells. And as shown here, it uh, co-transports both glucose and sodium. Glucose exits the cell through the basal lateral surface uh, through the GLU2 uh, channel and sodium, of course, through the sodium potassium uh, ATPs. So um, this is primarily uh, the, the target of inhibition. And by I say primarily, um, obviously there's small um, expression of this protein in other parts of the, of the nephron, but it's almost, almost entirely the, the proximal tubule. So what happens when you in inhibit pharmacologically this channel? Uh, well, as you would expect, uh, you're blocking reabsorption of glucose and sodium. And so you're going to have increased distal delivery of those solutes, but you're also going to have increased um, uh, in, sorry, uh, decreased reabsorption of uric acid, therefore uh, increase in uricosuria or urinary uric acid excretion. Um, the sodium that is delivered distally uh, will be then um, delivered to the, for example, to the loop of Henle thick ascending limb, where it'll be reabsorbed in part by sodium potassium two chloride channels, but also will be, that delivery will be sensed by the macula densa. And one early effect will be the, through the process of tubulo-glomerular feedback a reduction in glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure through afferent arterial uh, constriction. So that will lead to a, a short-term uh, decrease in GFR. Um, in patients who have early chronic kidney disease, the most you know, sort of famous model of that being diabetic nephropathy, that will lead to a beneficial or theoretically beneficial effect in hyperfiltration that's present in the remaining nephrons, which will also reduce albuminuria, but a host of other potentially beneficial effects have been both hypothesized and to some extent is demonstrated predominantly in human patients with uh, diabetic nephropathy, but in some cases with non-diabetic nephropathy too. So a decrease in oxygen consuming transport activity in the nephron, decreases in blood pressure through the effects of naturesis, decreases in body weight, and we know about the adverse effects of increased adiposity and obesity in ADPKD as well. And therefore uh, a prolongation or pr preservation of kidney function, or that is, reduction in the rate of decline of, of kidney disease. And I'll show a couple slides of that in just a second. So you can um, sort of uh, systematize or, or categorize these as both indirect effects, downstream indirect effects of the inhibition of SGLT2, um, including improvement in uric acid and blood pressure for diabetics, improvement in glycemic control and insulin, but also, as we mentioned, the direct effects. And I think it is fair to say, I'm again, not an expert in the field of this uh, treatment in diabetic nephropathy, but there is a lot of ongoing unresolved questions as to the precise mechanisms, which are more important in the short versus the long-term um, in, in slowing progression of, of, C, of uh, chronic kidney disease. But these have all been hypothesized and I think are, there's some variable levels of evidence to support them. But of course, the benefits of these class of inhibition of these drugs rather extends well beyond the kidney benefits, we also have benefits in cardiovascular health. And that's shown nicely in this review from circulation in, in, in 2006. Um, so by inducing glycosuria and induce, uh, reducing uh, body mass, in particular adiposity, you're also decreasing epicardial fat, which improves cardiac contractility. The decrease in inflammation and hyperglycemia can lead to improvements or at least slow the progression of atherosclerosis. And for those who are hyperuricemic, reduction in plasmuric acid might have the same effect. But the naturesis and also can directly impact on arterial stiffness, particularly again in patients who have type two diabetes, but perhaps in other, other causes of kidney disease too. We talked about the tubular glomerular feedback, which could lead to a decrease in intraglomerular capillary pressure and decreased hyperfiltration. And then the effects on, on plasma volume as well. So all of these translate potentially through variable um, variable uh, strengths of, of these mechanisms to both cardiac and renal protection. And we know that's true in patients with chronic kidney disease who don't have polycystic kidney disease in two very large phase three trials. Um, this is, well, at least two, I'm gonna show you two here. The first one was a trial of dapagliflozin. This is the famous DAPA-CKD trial. 
um, published in the New England Journal about three years ago, uh, was a uh, multi-center double-blind placebo-controlled trial of over 4,000 patients who had uh, both GFR of a, uh, sorry, chronic kidney disease with a GFR of at least 25 and albuminuria with or without type 2 diabetes. Um, given DAPA at 10 milligrams per day, the primary outcome was progression of chronic kidney disease defined commonly as is now the case and approved by the FDA as an outcome as a decline in GFR of at least 50% or kidney failure and hospitalization for heart failure and cardiovascular death. And this com composite outcome was improved dramatically. This is a, 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 an absolute risk reduction of more than 5% over several years of treatment. And that was uh, the benefit was observed both for kidney specific outcomes and cardiovascular outcome, and even from all cause mortality mortality. And again, one third of these patients had did not have diabetes. In Pagliflozin, similar results were seen um, in a slightly different cohort of patients, both with and without diabetes. And these also included patients who had more advanced kidney disease, a GFR of 20 to 45, but uh, it didn't, did, some of them didn't even have uh, abnormal albuminuria. And again, the, the primary outcome of progressive chronic kidney disease or cardiovascular death was a substantially lower in those who received EMPA. And there was no difference in the beneficial effect of empagliflozin in chronic kidney disease for those who had diabetes and those who were non diabetic. So, all of that seems to support a very beneficial effect of these medications, both for cardiovascular protection and slowing of progression of kidney disease, reducing the risk of end stage kidney failure uh, in chronic kidney disease with and without diabetes. And in fact, both these drugs are now uh, FDA approved for that, for that purpose. Okay, so with that in mind, what can we say about the effects of these drugs or this, this molecular target, inhibition of this target in ADPKD? And the first thing is that there are no interventional, there's no data from interventional trials because the DAPA CKD trial excluded patients who had polycystic kidney disease. The EMPA kidney trial also excluded patients who had polycystic kidney disease. The FDA approved prescribing information indicates that for both that pagliflozin and impagliflozin, that they are not recommended for the treatment of chronic kidney disease in patients with polycystic kidney disease. Now, when I, when I gave this talk some months ago to a, a, a different group, the PKD Outcomes Consortium, I think I incorrectly referenced, referred to this as a contraindication. And um, uh, one of the FDA representatives at the, at the call at the time corrected me, clarifying that it's not a contraindication, it's just that there is no recommendation for its use. And of course, it's because we have no data. So all of this is to help motivate a, our initial trial. But what we do have, um, and this gets a little bit complicated, is data in preclinical models. First of all, why, what, what specific mechanisms might explain a potential benefit for SGLT2 inhibition in cystic kidney disease. So there is some data which I'll show that perhaps this pathway may modify cystic epithelial cell proliferation, and that may be um, partially um, mediated through the MAP, MAP kinase pathway. Um, and by inducing the osmotic diuresis that is universal in SGLT2 inhibition, um, there might be a reduction or change in the transepithelial transport fluid electrolytes that might, even if cell proliferation is not affected, it might inhibit cell growth. And then there's also potentially beneficial changes in the hormone hormonal environment or paracrine and, and endocrine environments. For example, insulin is reduced in, in, in patients who are hyperinsulinemic and also the reduction in, in insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1. And so that may also have a, a potential benefit on the pathogenesis or progression of PKD. And something like that was seen in a, in a paper published in, in KI now about 10 years ago. This was um, in uh, the, um, this was in a rat model, uh, non-orthologous rat model of cystic kidney disease. The drug that was used here was fluorizin, which I should note, this is potentially important, seems to be a uh, less, or is a less selective SGLT inhibitor. So it also targets the, S the SGLT1 um, uh, receptor. Um, these were rats that were treated for five weeks, and what they found was that there was a significant improvement in creatinine clearance, that is kidney function. Um, there was a lower kidney weight to body weight ratio, which is obviously a, a, a commonly used measure 
of uh, nephromegaly and a lower cystic index as shown on the upper right um, figure here for uh, top of figure three. That also seemed to correspond to uh, with a lower, uh, lower markers of cell proliferation and turnover and um, partial inhibition of the MAP kinase pathway. So the, the authors here concluded that renal sodium glucose cotransporter inhibition might have a therapeutic effect in PKD. Um, this was a, a, a follow-up study, I, I believe by the same group or members of the same group um, that looked again at a rat model. And here they used an SGLT2 inhibitor specifically, the pagliflozin. They were given for five weeks. Granin clearance also stabilized or improved uh, compared to um, the vehicle treated group. And albuminuria was also improved. So again, this would sort of correspond to potentially results that were seen both in humans with diabetic kidney disease uh, and with non-diabetic, non-PKD. Um, what got a little confusing was that there wasn't a, a robust effect on cystogenesis. Um, and in fact, kidney weight was slightly higher, uh, only modestly so. Um, and there was no difference in the cyst index, cyst number, or cell proliferation. And that's shown in these two figures here, the black being the DAPA treaty group, and the white being the vehicle treaty group. So both cis index, cis number, and then here markers of cell proliferation did not substantially change. And when we go to other models and using other SGL2 inhibitors, this is a mouse model, PKD1 knockout model. And this study was actually looking at multiple sort of glucose lowering and metabolic um, in, in treatments um, across a large number of, of mice. And um, what they found generally was that Although other glucose lowering treatments like metformin and metformin and salsalate improved kidney uh, survival and reduced the cystic index, canagliflozin, at least uh, by itself, did not seem, or when combined with metformin, did not seem to have a substantial effect in this specific mouse model of PK. So what we have then, uh, oh, sorry, one, one last uh, um, preclinical study and Again, just trying to highlight what we thought was most relevant for our study design. This was the P now the PCK rat model, so a non-orthologous model of, of ARPKD. Um, and uh, they were treated with dap dapagliflozin. Um, they found that dapagliflozin had its expected physiologic effect on gly glycosuria and urine volume. But in fact, what was shown here is that kidney volume and cyst volume and cyst index were actually somewhat higher in the dapagliflozin-treated group. And yet there was no change in the cis number or in cell proliferation that, that those results are not shown here. So we have, um, I think to try to summarize this, we have very robust data in large clinical trials of patient, human patients with diabetic chronic kidney disease and non-diabetic chronic kidney disease without PKD. We also have um, some encouraging data in rat models, although a little bit discrepant effects perhaps on the GFR versus cystogenesis and depending on which SGLT inhibitor is used and perhaps which rat model. We have a neutral effect seen with an SGLT2 inhibitor in mice. And we have in this rat model of, of ARKPKD, we have the potential for actually enlarged, it's enlarging cysts. And the last thing I'm gonna comment on um, before we get to how this all motivated our trial is that there is some data that in in diabetics, not in patients with PKD, that SGLT2 inhibition can increase serum copeptin, which of course is a, is a, a marker of, of vasopressin. And in this case, um, depending on the state, this is um, on the left is the euglycemic state and on the right are hyperglycemic states. And they, these are actually patients with type one diabetes. We, don't, we know now not to treat these patients with SGLT2 inhibitors, but in this physiologic study that was what was selected. And what they found was that there were, there were modest but significant in, increases in copeptin, suggesting that um, uh, this may be potentially one mechanism of concern where um, SGLT2 inhibitor could um, potentially, uh, or at least theoretically increase a cyst enlargement. So, now on to how this all motivated and what we decided to do with uh, the design of our first in PKD randomized clinical trial. And this, as uh, Terry mentioned, very fortunate to be collaborating with wonderful collaborators at the University of Colorado, some of whom are on the, on the meeting today uh, and uh, who have uh, 
tremendous experience in clinical trials in this area. So um, our conceptual model for why we thought this trial was justified was really along the lines, the mechanistic lines that I commented on already, that the effects of SGLT2 inhibitor on slowing kidney function decline, maybe on slowing cyst growth, although again, we saw some discrepant findings in the preclinical model, um, would be mediated by um, reductions in intracomarial pressure, decreased cortical oxygen demand, decrease IGF-1, but the vascular effects would also be mediated through inflammation and oxidative stress. So all this would lead to, on the top, decreased vascular dysfunction, I'll show you how we measure that in a second, decreased kidney function decline, and um, decreased cyst growth. So this study was a parallel group, pilot level, placebo-controlled randomized clinical trial. Um, the sponsors of this trial are the NIDDK, and also we're very fortunate to have um, additional funding from the PKD Foundation. It's a study that is uh, being conducted um, in 50 adult participants with ADPKD. These are non-diabetic, so people who would not otherwise have any indication clinically for, um, for SGLT2 inhibitors, but they're at high risk for disease progression based on their male classification. I'll get to that in a second. The two clinical sites that I mentioned, both the University of Maryland and the University of Colorado Schools of Medicine. This is a 12-month intervention trial, and the primary aims first, consistent with the phase two design, are to determine the safety and tolerability, and we're using empagliflozin at its FDA-recommended maximum dose for patients with chronic kidney disease, not non-PKD, which is 25 milligrams a day. The secondary aims, though, as that last slide showed, are to de derive preliminary estimates of the 12 month changes in both height adjusted kidney volume, GFR, but also copeptin, again, getting there to what the uh, long term chronic changes are in vasopressin, health related quality of life, vascular function, and urinary CHEM1, a, a biomarker of uh, renal tubular injury. So the study design looks like this we have a screening visit uh, where we perform uh, confirm eligibility, and then we go to a baseline visit. And in fact, because of very uh, robust patient registries, both at Maryland and Colorado, we've been able to combine these into a single visit to reduce participant burden. So we can be essentially certain of their eligibility at the time that they enroll. We perform baseline measures on pulse wave velocity. Uh, we get an uh, MRI, health-related quality of life, GFR, copeptin, urinary, chem one are measured at baseline. The randomization is one-to-one. -one. We start with the recommended initial dose of empagliflozin, which is 10 milligrams. Uh, we monitor them for tolerability and then titrate them up, if, if, if possible, to 25 milligrams. Um, if they don't tolerate the 25 milligrams, then they continue on a lower dose. And we have the option to down titrate at later time points if there's further tolerability issues. So we have uh, a three-month in-person assessment where we again um, systematically look at tolerability, adverse events. We look at our secondary outcomes, including kidney function, health-related quality of life, our biomarkers, kidney volume, and then again at 12 months. So we actually have this down to just three visits, over three in-person visits over a 12-month period, which we believe has substantially improved or enhanced the feasibility of the study. So who are we enrolling? Well, this is these are our eligibility criteria. So these are patients who are younger and, I guess, middle-aged. Um, being over 50, I'm not sure what counts as middle-aged anymore, but their GFR has to be um, at least 30, 30 to 90, and they have to be at high risk for progression based on the Mayo imaging classification. And for those who are unfamiliar with this, this is a system that looks at the kidney volume basically um, uh, for their age. So younger people with sort of moderately large kidneys or older people with very, very large kidneys and index to height. And they can't be have AKIs, they have to have stable kidney function over the prior three months. We have a range of exclusion criteria which are designed primarily to exclude people who already have a reason to use this drug. For example, if they're known to be diabetic or are discovered to be diabetic because of the, um, the, the screening labs of our study that hasn't ha happened yet, or if they have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, which is already a, 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 a clinical indication to use the drug. We're excluding patients who already have low blood pressure because this, this blood medication does lower blood pressure modestly. Uh, or who have uncontrolled hypertension and medications that might interact uh, with STL2 inhibitor loop diuretic, which relatively few PKD patients are on. But this one is one we, and I'll get to this as a, as a major 
um, decision point for our, our trial design if they're currently using tolvaptin. There are known side effects of this medication in, in increasing the risk of urogenital infections, at least in diabetics and urinary tract infections. So patients who already have that are also not eligible uh, and some other contraindications as shown here. So we've tried to design a population that would be of potential benefit from this drug. Um, they are at high risk for progression. They don't have very advanced kidney disease uh, and they have no um, contraindication either by needing the drug or not tolerating it, being likely to tolerate. So the primary aim, as I mentioned, is to determine the safety and tolerability, that is the feasibility of prescribing this drug for 12 months in patients with a GFR of 30 to 90. So you have to define these things. And um, as is common in phase two, it's based on a sort of slightly arbitrary, but sort of general consensus level of, um, of cut, or cut points or thresholds of how many people can take the medicine. In this case, the tolerability is the percentage of people who can tolerate 25 milligrams or the full prescribed dose at, at all the way through 12 months. Safety is obviously uh, all adverse events, but we're looking at very specific adverse events of interest, which are known both from, uh, from the, the SGLT2 inhibitor literature and other populations. So acute kidney injury, often when it's occurred in say diabetics, it's been from volume depletion, urinary tract infections because of the glycosuria and urogenital infections for the same reason. So our hypothesis of, is that it's safe and well tolerated. Um, this is, uh, all of the assessments that we're performing. And just to give you a uh, sort of a, a quick view of what it is, not meaning to overwhelm everyone, but again, we have a screening and baseline visits that are being in most patients combined into a single visit. T means that we're, we're doing the early safety assessment and tolerability all by telephone. Again, as a way to reduce uh, visit burden to participants. We have patients, uh, uh, Terry and I do in Baltimore that are driving from out of state as does Colorado. Of course, when you're coming from out of state from Colorado, it's a much further uh, travel than from Maryland. So even more important uh, if they're coming from you know hundreds of miles away. Um, and then uh, the face-to-face -face visit at three months with the initial MRI and uh, GFR measures, again, at six and nine months, and then the last visit at 12 months. So that's where the study ends at 12 months. The drugs, as I mentioned, can be up or down titrated at any time, depending on tolerability, but the maximum dose is 25 months. So we, we a priori define that if at least 70% of patients in the intervention arm can tolerate the full randomized protocol specified dose, that that would support the further development of this uh, drug for phase three efficacy trials. We'll get to the question of who will pay for those at the end of the talk here, but um, we're also just describing the population of or proportion of patients who had to discontinue their treatment for safety reasons. And that includes in the placebo group because that we are all gonna be blinded. Um, the proportion who have to discontinue treatment because not because they had like a particular safety event, but just because they didn't otherwise tolerate the medicine. And those who had at least 80% pill compliance, which is a very standard threshold for indicating adherence to uh, 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 at least a daily medication. And then we're gonna describe the proportion who have specific and general adverse events. In two is to look at, um, uh, oops, excuse me, estimates of placebo corrected change at 12 months in total kidney volume, right? The most standard and uh, widely used surrogate measure of progression of PKD. An estimated GFR, and we accept that there may be some initial decline purely for hemodynamic reasons. So we can also separate that out from the long-term changes uh, at 12 months. Copeptin, which is the marker of vasopressin secretion. KIM-1, our tubular injury biomarker. Pulse wave velocity, which is a widely used non-invasive measure of large artery stiffness, and then health-related quality of life. And for that, we're using the ADPKD impact scale, which was developed by uh, Dorothy Oberhan and uh, Atsuka. And um, I'll get to that in one second, but this is just a, a summary of our secondary outcomes and the justification for them, uh, why we thought that this would be all useful. The study is not specifically powered to detect significant effects as is with a phase two trial, but at least to give a sense of the direction, perhaps, of the effect and then to provide um, estimates to allow us to power a phase three trial. This is the um, health-related quality of life instrument. Some of you may be very familiar and perhaps some have never seen this before, but it's, um, it asks about the experience of polycystic kidney disease symptoms over the past two weeks and the interference of those symptoms with common uh, 
common activities of daily living. So talk about like uh, things of um, uh, chores in the home, household activities, leisure activities, exercise, but also um, you know the shape of the abdomen, pain, of course, as a being a common one, um, and urination. So this is a validated instrument and other uh, trials are using it. And certainly it, 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 I think it makes all the sense in the world to consider these symptoms. We have a drug that potentially can cause uh, increased uh, urinary flow and, and uh, polyuria in a population that already suffers from that at baseline. This is a study, uh, although not always the case or often not the case with phase two trials, but we had developed and have chartered and they've met an, in, an independent data safety monitoring board. Um, they are meeting every six months. So we've already had a, a, some meetings with them um, and they have full authorization to suspend or terminate the trial. But in particular, and in response to comments from uh, our initial grant submission to study section, there's an interim evaluation that will occur when 25 or half of the patients receive three months of follow-up treatment. And this uh, board will be tasked by examining rates of what we call early rapid progression, both on changes in height adjusted total kidney volume, which we have a priori designed, described or defined as at least a 5% worsening. Again, this is only three months. And GFR, which would be at least a 30% decline. So if they find a large imbalance, then the DSMB can decide to terminate the trial. And um, this is not, there's not a formal, um, stopping criteria as you would see in a phase two trial, just because the, the sample size will not provide that robust a quantitative analysis. So I want to now talk uh, in the last few minutes about some of the challenges that we face and the questions we faced when designing this trial. The first question seems like a, a really obvious one, but do we need to do this trial? <laughs> so in other words, I just showed you data on like, you know, 8,000 people with chronic kidney disease, right? That the drug works, it's safe, it prevents cardiovascular events and it, and it slows or reduces the risk of going on to kidney failure. Is that enough? Okay. Well, the short answer is, or what the things that we considered were that we have drugs that specifically are, rec are not recommended for use in PKD because they've never been tested. Right? They've never been tested in PKD. And this is something that I think a lot of nephrologists, community nephrologists, others are actually less familiar with. Um, I know myself and Terry and perhaps other clinicians on the call have gotten phone calls or messages or emails from um, community nephrologists saying, hey, can I put my PKD patient on EMPA? Because that's what everyone's doing, you know. And I think our answer, at least thus far, is no, not as part of routine clinical care. A, the FDA doesn't recommend it. And B, we cannot assume that the mechanisms of progression in ADPKD, particularly early in their course, are different, right? Are the same, sorry, from diabetic and say hypertensive nephrosclerosis. In fact, we know that there are very potentially different mechanisms. So, okay, if we need to do a clinical trial, can we just go to a stage three trial where we enroll a thousand patients or 800 patients? We follow them for three years, whatever it is. And we're looking at that, we're powering a study to look at the slope of GFR, just like they did with Tolbaptin and they tried to do with uh, Venglistat and others. So, we also, um, you know, again, talked with colleagues in the field and we came up with some difference of opinion on this, but motivating our desire for a phase two safety and tolerability trial was this, the limited preclinical and physiologic data that at least raised the possibility of worsening cystogenesis with, this with, this, with these drugs. And in fact, that's exactly what the grant reviewers heed on. And if they asked us to go back and actually assess the safety earlier than we had originally planned. Since we've designed this trial, I wanted to just uh, let our readers know about another paper that came out very, very recently. Um, this is an observational study, uh, a single center retrospective cohort study of, of only 20 patients. It has many limitations, which I'll get to in a, in a minute, but just to let everyone know if they, uh, it was not in a journal I think that many of us normally read, but um, so these were all patients who got treated with DAPA at 10 milligrams, the full, full dose and they had their GFR and kidney volume assessed. Now they were assessed as part of routine care, so it happened at all different time points, but somewhere between 70 and 156 days. So two months up to six months, say, five months. And the results for GFR are shown here. So before they were started on DAPA, they had a GFR of 50.8, and then this is sort of the trend of the GFR before they got treated. This is the trend after. Um, what the author suggests is that the GFR declined more than was observed in the pre-treatment period. 
at 108 days. Now, some of this would be expected because we know that there is a small decrease in GFR in the first few weeks, usually six weeks of treatment that's hemodynamically mediated. But this effect would be really beyond six weeks. So they suggested that that was something more. Kidney volume was only compared to two time, well, largely at two time points. And um, this looks like a very small difference in median, but because they're, they're measuring the, the kidney volume at only a few months after, when they annualized it out, that they suggested that this was actually a very substantial increase on the order of about 24% annual increase in total kidney volume. In comparison, when they looked at the trajectory of total kidney volume during this period, kidney volume was actually decreasing or staying the same. Its decrease on average was about 1.4% annually. So this may also provide a safety signal, although I think one has to be very, very cautious in interpreting it. For one, there was no control group. This is just a retrospective really case series, I would guess is the best way to describe it. In fact, when you look at their data, 53 patients were all offered dipagliflozin, which would be very much not standard of care in Europe and North America. The 20 who agreed to take it were then the ones who were followed. So we don't know what happened to the others. Um, very importantly, more than half of these patients were also on tilbaptin. And we as others have a great concern about potentiating volume depletion when you combine these two classes of drugs because of the profound aquaretic and then notriuretic effects when combined. So I think that this is a practice of care that would be really very, very different from what is considered, at least in the US and, and North America. And then lastly, there are some technical challenges because A, they were, they were utilizing um, somewhat older methods of calculating kidney, total kidney volume in the ellipsoid method, measured method, which makes a lot of assumptions. And then they were using short-term changes, even just in a couple of months, and then annualizing them out to over a year. There's assuming that the rate of TKV trajectory would continue from what was observed in two months all the way to 12 months. So what they concluded, which I think is a fair statement for sure, is that additional interventional studies are required. So. I bring this up in part to let people know who may be unfamiliar with it, in part to let them know some limitations, but also to say that I think that the results of this do support our decision to begin the investigation with a phase two safety and tolerability. We also debated um, who should be eligible, and um, I won't go into great detail on this, but at the time that we developed our trial, um, DAPA, uh, dipagliflozin was approved for GFR down to 25. So we we chose a GFR of 30 just to sort of round up for safety. And also, again, if we weren't going to use this in clinical care, the long greatest long-term benefit would be, of course, before patients have developed very advanced kidney disease. I mentioned about the concurrent tilvaptin therapy, and this is a challenge that every new drug or uh, must face when um, designing their trials. Do you include or exclude these patients? I think in this case, we had great concerns about potentially interactive adverse effects. And that's what motivated our decision to accept only patients who were not using tilbaptin. Now, these could have been patients who were on it and didn't tolerate it because of the aquaretic side effects, because they had liver function abnormalities. Uh, or we just, you know, every center is a little different, but we just have a number of patients who after hearing about the benefits and risks and side effects decide not to go on. And so that's who we're enrolling today. The last thing I just want to mention, which I alluded to in the very beginning, is who should pay for this clinical trial. Um, one can make the good argument that the pharma companies that are already licensing uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, and which are very, very well-selling drugs, I think it's fair to say um, that perhaps they should be the source of funding. They all declined to support this trial when we approached them, um, and uh, either both financially or to provide a study drug. And I just state that as a fact, not as a, not as an intent to criticize anybody. Um, the reality though is most of these drugs are already approved for long-term treatment in very common chronic diseases, heart failure, chronic kidney disease, diabetes. So the financial gain in gaining authorization for ADPKD would be a very tiny additional market share. So we do suggest, and I know um, this came up <laughs> in our consortiums meeting um, last hour, but that there is a role for federal and nonprofit funding for the testing of this, these drugs that are marketed for other diseases, right? In ADPKD, in other words, repurposing them. And by extension, I would also suggest in other rare kidney diseases too. Now, when you, the way we did it was we basically bought the ingredient wholesale 
uh, which costs a lot of money. So we were very fortunate to get funding beyond the more restricted amount that's available in, a, uh, say, an R01, um, and that helps us offset the, the cost of this. So I'm going to stop there and be happy to take questions, and I appreciate all your patience. Uh, acknowledging all of my wonderful co-investigators, uh, many of whom are on the this meeting, uh, our research coordinators, the NIDDK for funding our project, the PKD Foundation for their incredible generosity, and then uh, very uh, specifically all of our very generous participants. We're almost at 25 enrolled now um, and who have given us a lot of their time uh, and effort to help us study this. So thank you very much. I'll stop there. Thank you, Steve, for that uh, great summary. And I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, if people want to put their questions in the chat, that'd be great. Uh, OK, I'll Taka, go ahead. Yes, um, thank you for that uh, talk. Um, I mean, um, so diabetic kidney disease is a glomerular disease and PKD is a tubular disease. And so, you know, it's a completely different mechanism. Are you, and there's study, you know, studies that glucose can feed the cyst, cyst growth. Um, those are lots of preclinical studies. So dumping a lot of glucose down the uh, glomerulus to the tubules, are you worried that that would actually stimulate the non-cystic tubules to grow into a cyst or, you know, uh, it sounds to me like it's feeding more glucose down, right. down the nephron. So I just had it. No, I think that's that's a, a, a wonderful point and and definitely a, a a a possible issue of concern. And that I would say in the preclinical models was not observed in the, most of those studies. Um, that even in those cases where. Um, where GFR was was improved, right? It, they didn't they didn't observe um, any substantial growth in uh, cystogenesis or cyst enlargement. There was one study that did find that as well. Uh, did find cyst enlargement or greater cyst burden uh, with one of the SGLT2 inhibitors in one rat model. But I think you know that's that's why this all needs to be tested in human populations carefully with very appropriate uh, close follow up and monitoring. And it might be that the mechanisms of slowing GFR decline will be entirely independent of their effects on, on cis progression. And that's something that we hope to at least begin to address by uh, the measurements that we're making yeah, over 12 months. Nira, and then uh, Ron has a question in the chat. Okay. Um, uh, Steve, thank you. I thought that was a really, like, I, I think this study design is really nice because it will definitively answer the question. So I appreciate that. Um, I, I think with SGLT2 inhibitors, the CKD benefit seems most marked for patients with proteinuria. Uh, and so I was looking at your inclusion exclusion criteria. I didn't see any specific thoughts about proteinuria or uh, whether or not it made sense to uh, at least um, uh, segregate your patients that have proteinuria from those who don't to see if that's a you know, precessive specified subgroup that you want to look at, um, kind of how you thought about that. No, an excellent question, Nira. And of course, I mean, one could, I suppose, argue the same about um, you know, RAS inhibitors and, you know, corticoid receptor antagonists that their effects generally tend to be greater in those with um, greater proteinuria. I, you know, uh, of course, as you know, most PKD patients have very low levels of proteinuria. We didn't require it as an eligibility criteria in part because we did not think it would be feasible to enroll only overtly albuminuric patients with PKD. Um, we, we are collecting urine at all the time points. So at baseline in three months and 12 points, 12 months. So we'll be able to look at in a post hoc fashion at least. And I think this gets to Ron's question too. What are the changes in albuminuria and also whether, um, you know, whether there might be some subgroup that seems to have a greater benefit with the caveat, of course, that overall, you know, we have a relatively small enrollment population. So, but yeah, that's, that's a point is very well taken. I think it gets to one of those very crucial questions whenever you design a clinical trial uh, in terms of, um, you know, what is the pure science question and what is feasible? And that's often those trade-offs that we, we have to make, you know, with, with difficulty. 
Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm just going to ask one, Steve, do you have any um, sort of assessment or, or Michelle, how much the exclusion of uh, individuals on Tolvaptin, uh, how, how mm -hmm. challenging is that for recruitment? And if you have any thoughts, um, I, I, you might have specific reasons for not having included that, but I think it's going to be an issue for the yeah. other trials going forward and whether you had any Thoughts. Yeah, I can I can start with that, and Michelle, feel free to chime in. I mean, I think one of the things we decided is that we because there was enough uncertainty, right, even about the short term safety of this drug in PKD, that we want to test that specifically, you know, in in its own in isolation. Um, but I think uh, if one were to move to a phase three trial, one would almost certainly need to at least consider enrolling those patients. Otherwise, well, this is true with most you know most new investigation or most agents being studied in PKD for the first time, um, it would be, un it might be unfeasible, right? If you excluded everyone on Tobaptin to, to complete a phase three trial. But at least we can address the question of the safety in, in and of itself in isolation. Michelle, anything else? I agree, Steve. Uh, by the way, wonderful presentation. I, I, I would say that we're still seeing a lot of participants that are not willing to be on Tobaptin. I mean, that's the reality. I think we can all agree that these patients read about their their condition, their disease states, their treatment, and they just don't want to, and they want to actually look for other options. And actually, a lot of the interventions that we're doing here at the University of Colorado are yeah, excluding tolbaptin, uh, just to try to better identify the effect of the intervention. And I just want to add also a comment about the whole issue of SGLT2s in diabetic kidney disease. I, I think, Tak, I think you, you had a great question. Also, we have to remember that the drugs have been proven to be beneficial in non-diabetic kidney disease, combination of glomerular and tubular interstitial diseases. So it, it's not only diabetic kidney disease. The drug has really, I agree that obviously the effect is more pronounced in those with more pronounced proteinuria, like many of the other interventions, but uh, it, it has been proven in non glomerular non-diabetic disease. So. Right, most of whom would presumably have either arteriosclerosis or and tubular interstitial. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, go ahead, sorry. Nira, sorry. do you have another question? Yeah, no, I just wanted to make a comment about the uh, tolbaptin and SGLT2 inhibition use. So. I had a patient who has both uh, diabetes and uh, was on tolbaptin for, for PKD, still is at, at Yale. And, uh, and he inadvertently got started on the SGLT2 by his primary for management of the, the diabetes and then developed AKI, which we saw when we were doing the, the testing um, because we were checking um, uh, creatinine at the same time we check LFTs. And so I think that's a very real thing, whether you know, I think it's the same as if you were combining various drugs that cause a, an elevation in creatinine. If I had left him on those two, maybe he would have stabilized at a higher creatinine, but I, I made him stop the SGLT2 inhibitor at that point. So. No, thank you, Nira. That's great. And I think that, I mean, just again, purely anecdotally, I don't have any like, you know, national surveys on this, but that seemed to be what, what the approach that most nephrologists, treating nephrologists are taking. There was, I think, a question from Ron about Travel? Did I get that right? Sorry, Ron. Um, Michelle, do yeah. you, do you pay travel expenses? If I have a participant in Boston, what should I tell them? So, so yes, Ron, we, we do pay for uh, travel expenses or to Maryland or Colorado, uh, flights, hotels, stay, everything. Yeah, and, and I realized what I completely forgot to mention, and Michelle, maybe you can fill it in, was the the, the wonderful um, philanthropic uh foundation mm -hmm. that is helping to support this beyond the PKD foundation. Yeah, absolutely. The, yes, this is being supported beyond the NADDK, the PKD foundation, and we're able to attract patients pretty much from from really around the country, so, which is wonderful. Any other questions? If not, any questions? Then I just want to thank um, Steve. I want to thank Michelle. It's really exciting study and thank you to everyone for your participation and we hope to see you in January and have a happy holidays, happy new year. Bye everybody. Bye. Thanks. Have a great New Year's. Thank you.